record this. I'm going to record the meeting so that I can send it tomorrow to the members who are unable to be here tonight. I'll send it, of course, to everybody who's here. It's a link, uh, and it just is a uh, uh, audio video uh, recording of this uh, meeting. Hi, Nick. Okay, a couple more minutes, and then off we go. I need two more. I need two more participants to win the over and under. Okay, why don't we get moving? Uh, I want to welcome everybody to the April Eshore Management Team meeting. I'm very grateful to all of you for the support that you've given not only me but to the community and the management team for the past three years. It's a big deal to me, and and I can't express my gratitude to you. It. In any, any more than I'm trying to do it now. Um, we have a special meeting tonight. The candidates who are trying to get Justin's job are here. And Justin is here, of course, current mayor who is running for re-election. We should know that. And um, the five folks who are going to uh, be running in the primary and the election are here. And they'll have an opportunity to chat in a few minutes. Um, I promised Brian McDermott, and when the police Lieutenant says, I, I think I should be there. I told Brian, it's perfectly fine. So I'll just have Brian McDermott say a few words to us before we uh, get into the uh, other part of the meeting. Brian, good evening, how are you? Good evening, Howie, good evening, everybody. How are you? Doing well, doing good. well. Good. Take a couple of minutes. East neighborhood cop. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're ready to get started, I can jump right into it. I know we've got a lot to do uh, this meeting, so uh, I can get right moving if you'd like. Right now. Go do it. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Mayor, candidates, management team. Uh, the report for uh, for March 2023. It was another uh, pretty good month for the Cove, but there were some areas that I, I did have some concerns with. Uh, overall, good numbers, no homicides, no one shot. Uh, we did have two incidents of gunfire I'll get into. No robberies, uh, a lone burglary, and a lone theft from vehicle. In total, uh, we had uh, 1,110 calls for service for the month. The uh, The burglary occurred at the uh, very uh, north end of area of concern of this management team at 222 Farron Avenue. Uh, that's right on, the, uh, on our side of the Ferry Street Bridge over there at Farron and East Ferry. Uh, someone was gracious enough to call in a suspicious individual outside there at, uh, at 9.30 p.m. on Saturday, March 11th. Uh, officers showed up. By the time they did, uh, the individual had already uh, broken through the front door to commit a burglary. Uh, nothing much was taken, but he did damage the restaurant. And, and thanks to the good investigative work from our officers over on the Whaley Avenue side, they were able to link this burglary to other burglaries in that area, identify the suspect, and make an arrest on this. So uh, good work on that. Gunshots uh, at 150 Kendall Street for the auto body shop over there. A customer had brought their vehicle over for service. Uh, it was a very distinct uh, purple uh, vehicle. While uh, after the shop was closed, a uh, vehicle pulled up, male exited the vehicle and fired 31 rounds uh, into the, uh, to the purple car left there for repairs. Uh, even more concerning is it appears that uh, he was able to fire so fast because the uh, handgun had been altered, uh, rendering it fully automatic with, uh, with an extended magazine. This is something that we're still looking into and investigating. The registered owner was contacted. Uh, wasn't sure why anyone would want to uh, want to shoot at her vehicle. She mentioned she had just purchased it. Uh, the investigation for this is ongoing. Uh, there was a second incident of gunfire in a part of the city. We don't normally receive it over in the area of 400 Burr Street. Uh, there was a party that appears to be out of hand. Uh, a registered gun owner's uh, weapons were fired at this incident. Officers responded. Um, due to uh, intoxication of a lot of people present uh, and several conflicting stories. It was uh, somewhat of an involved investigation, but the officers uh, appear to have gotten to the bottom of it. We do have an arrest warrant pending uh, for the drill there that was submitted to court after about a week long investigation. And we have moved to revoke the, uh, the pistol permit of the, uh, of the registered owner there. Um, some people in the area have also come forward and, and been very helpful uh, detailing some other problems with this particular uh, house. So I just want to thank the, uh, the community for their cooperation on that one. Um, 
lastly, and, and again, I promise to be quick here. So uh, it's just to mention the, uh, the federal indictments. Uh, our Detective Bureau, uh, in conjunction with the FBI, the ATF, the DEA, uh, you name the federal agency, was able to make progress on, uh, on what was over a year's long investigation uh, into certain individuals uh, frequenting the exit eight area who do affiliate with each other in a, in a gang type fashion. Uh, they were able to link two homicides and 10 non-fatal shootings to six individuals uh, from this group, uh, all of them who are familiar, uh, very familiar to me and my officers out here. Uh, it's just fantastic work to be able to get solves on, on these acts of violence and really to, uh, to take down and, and bring serious cases against some of the most violent offenders of our city. Uh, so I am extremely thrilled to report that. In addition, the DEA was actually able to, uh, to hit some houses, one on Lower Quinnipiac Avenue and one over on Assumption Street. That was uh, part of a region-wide uh, investigation they had into somebody distributing opioids, uh, also with fentanyl, that were responsible for many overdoses out here in this area. And that spanned from East Haven, West Haven, uh, Ansonia, Milford, uh, and there was uh, involvement out here as well. So I really want to thank our federal partners for, for assisting us and using their resources uh, to help bring down two serious uh, issues, both the violence and the opioid epidemic uh, here on the East Shore. Uh, as, for, uh, as for the report, I'm all done. That's it. So I, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Mr. Chairman and, and the candidates. Thank you, Lieutenant McDermott, for taking good care of us. It's much appreciated, it really is. Um, the, there's a format that we've established with all the candidates. Each of the candidates will have a few minutes to tell us about their vision for the future of the city of New Haven. Um, when all of the candidates are finished, we'll open the floor to questions, and all of the candidates have promised that they'll stay here until the questions are uh, asked. So I'll ask you to wait until all of the candidates are finished and then everybody will have a chance to ask whatever questions they wish of whichever candidate they choose. So if we have an order here. Liam Brennan is gonna go first. Shafiq Abdusabur will go second. Wendy Hamilton then, Tom Goldenberg, and then Mayor Justin Elliker. So Liam, you wanna start us off and take a few minutes and tell us what your vision is for the future of the city of New Haven. Sure thing, Howie. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate, I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you having us all here. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with the folks of the East Shore CMT and everybody else who showed up. I see a lot of friends from a lot of other CMTs around town and just from out there in town. So thank you all for giving us this chance to talk to you directly. Uh, I'm Liam Brennan. For those of you who don't know me, um, I moved to New Haven about 20 years ago, and I immediately fell in love with the city. I love our different neighborhoods, our diverse people, our unique food culture. And I knew immediately that I wanted to make this my home and raise my family here. And over the past 19 years, uh, that is what I have done. And I have played many different roles here in New Haven. Um, I was with the Department of Justice for a little over 10 years. Um, I was an assistant U.S. attorney here in New Haven. And then I was the director of the Public Corruption Task Force, overseeing all public corruption cases in the state of Connecticut um, and all federal agencies working those cases. Um, then I left the Department of Justice and I became a staff attorney at New Haven Legal Assistance, where I worked on uh, housing of affordable housing issues um, and helped put together the Room for All Coalition. Um, from there, I became the executive director of the Connecticut Veterans Legal Center, a statewide uh, legal services organization that represents veterans recovering from homelessness and mental illness <clears throat> uh, to help them gain access to housing, health care, and income. And I currently serve as the inspector general in Hartford. Uh, besides being a dad and attorney, over those years, I've served in many other roles in New Haven. Um, I've been a board member at Junta for Progressive Action, um, Neighborhood, Housing Services, uh, Neighborhood Housing Services of New Haven, Elm City Cycling, and the Community Placemaking Engagement Network. And while I think anyone would be lucky to live in the Elm City, I also recognize that we face significant challenges, and challenges that can only be addressed through bold changes. You know, I have four kids. My kids have been in the public schools for about eight years. And almost every year during that time, we have seen teachers leave our schools. Um, in mid-year, currently at Brendan Rogers, we have no teachers in, in the middle school and children have been moved out mid-year to other schools. At Wexler Grant, we only have one teacher uh, in the middle school there. And the rest of the students in other classes have a rotating mix of teachers, sometimes substitutes, sometimes no teacher at all. 
Our teachers here in New Haven are underpaid and many of them feel unappreciated. And we will never make the inroads in education unless that changes. At the same time, here in New Haven, we have a vacancy rate of less than 2% in the city. What that means for a city that has a majority uh, of residents as renters is that there is not enough homes in this city for the people who live here, let alone the people who are moving into the city. We are held back from creating more housing and particularly more affordable housing from an outdated zoning code um, that was intended when it was created to suburbanize New Haven, which doesn't work for our residents. And I see no urgencies to make the big changes that we need to, to address this problem from City Hall today. If we don't do this, we will see rising rates of homelessness here in New Haven, and we will also see residents who live here getting pushed out of the city. But no one is talking frankly to the public about what needs to be done. What we are talking about often uh, is the continuing epidemic of gun violence. But what we are doing about it is talking about it in antiquated ways and falling back on old solutions that don't work. Uh, there have been no city level initiatives to control the number of guns in this city. Instead, we're falling back on tired and ineffective practices uh, like randomly stopping cars and trying to search them for guns. This has been proven to be an ineffective way to address gun violence. And all it does is drive a wedge between law enforcement and the communities they are supposed to serve particularly black and brown communities. I think we can do better. In fact, I know we can do better. <clears throat> there are cities here in the United States and around the country that are taking more innovative approaches to these problems, and we can do so here in New Haven. I have a history of leading organizations and government initiatives in new and more effective ways. And in doing so, particularly for the benefit of everyday citizens against powerful corporate and political interests. That's a record I wanna to bring to City Hall. As a resident, I am tired of watching our municipal leaders tread water on these issues. Here in New Haven, we have the talent, we've got the uh, intelligence, we've got the ingenuity to take on these problems and chart a new course with City Hall. It simply takes vision and the political will to make change. That's the message that I want the city to hear. That is why I'm here with you tonight. I am so thankful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to answering uh, any of your questions. So thank, thank you so you very much. much Liam. Thank you. That was Liam Brennan. Uh, Shafiq Abdusabur. Shafiq, would you take a few minutes and tell us about your vision for the city of New Haven? Yes. And thank you, Howie, for having me. And good evening to the residents of the city of New Haven and the East Shore management team. Good evening to our mayor, Justin Elliker. Uh, Liam and Tom and Wendy, um, good evening as well. I'm happy to be a part of this mayoral campaign. I'm excited. You know, this is probably one of the most exciting things that I have gotten involved in since the birth of my four children in New Haven, right? Um, I am 56 years old. I am a retired police sergeant for the city of New Haven, my police department, um, lifelong civil servant. I'm a fourth generation New mm -hmm. Havener. My great grandfather actually helped build the Q Bridge. Um, that was the story that I grew up with as a kid. My grandfather, who had a sixth grade education, would always say, you know, daddy, he built that bridge. Now, I didn't know I was six years old. I thought my great grandfather was the architect. But in fact, he was a laborer. He was a blue collar worker. Like I wind up becoming a blue collar worker, like my son. Ismael Abdusabar, who's 26 years old. He bought the house next door. He's a police officer. He's been a police officer for now for three years. He has a beautiful three-year-old granddaughter, my first grandchild, and a six-month-old grandson that lives next door. My mother asked me the other day, she said, what do you think, son? After you become mayor and you've done with that, you think you'll retire and leave? I said, Ma, I'll never retire. Ismail just bought the house next door. That's a 25 year contract. I'm here for the next 25 years. I'm never moving away from these grandkids. Here's what I'm saying to you tonight. Um, I'll shower you at another date with all of the things that I've done, but I'll break it down in a really simple format. I was a police officer for 21 and a half years in this city. I walked almost every single street in this city. I've seen New Haven at its best, and I had to see New Haven, unfortunately, when it was at its worst. 
I never passed judgment on the citizens of this city. Some of them fell on hard times. Some of them continue to fall on hard times. Some made bad decisions. Some made the only decisions that was left to them by the disinvestment in communities. So why am I running for mayor of New Haven? Because I was one of those young, poor black boys growing up in the city of New Haven in disinvested communities. And my parents, my father, who was a mailman, my mother, who was a homemaker, working three part-time jobs, trying to make ends meet. They were able to send me to St. Aidan's um, uh, Grammar School and then on to Notre Dame. They worked like hell to give me a good education. And all they asked in return was that I work like hell to be a good person and to make the world around me a better place. So why am I running for mayor in New Haven? I wanna make this city better. I want better schools, better school opportunities for all of the students, for all of the kids, for the 15,000 undocumented immigrants that live East Shore, just on the other side of the road from you, who are fighting like hell to live in this city for affordable housing. I need, I want, we need affordable housing for poor people, low income people, homeless people, and people who can actually afford it. I'll leave you with this little note. My mother called me about two weeks ago. My mother's 71. She lives in Westville. She owns her own home. She has her taxes and abatement because she's on an $800 a month social security budget. She says, son, I'm not low income. She said, I'm almost no income. I got 800 bucks. <laughs> my sister, me and my brother, we all pitch in with her every month to help her out with groceries and whatever she needs to close the gap. Her roof needs to be done. We have to fund that roof being done. The windows, whatever needs to happen. So I reached out to my mother because she's a lot. She's a lot. She's a lot. And I said, hey, mom, I haven't talked to you in a couple of days. I called you last week to take you out to lunch. You didn't get back to me. I said, but I'll be by, it was Wednesday. I said, I will be by Sunday to bring you some money. And she said, no problem, son. I have not been feeling well. She's recovering from cancer. She has a pacemaker. And she said, don't worry, son. But if you could come by a little early, it would be really good because all I have is 71 cents. And I like to put a little gas in my car. My mother is lucky because she actually owns her home. It may get eaten up in taxes and all those other issues, but at least she has a place to stay that's safe. But she's just one of the few. There's so many others that I have met. Many of you, some may even be on this call, trying to juggle your social security or a small pension and trying to make life work for you in this city. You want a mayor, me as your mayor, who is going to fight like hell to make sure that your pension and your social security and your budget not just works for you, but that you will have a city moving forward for your grandchildren where they won't have to struggle. I'm fighting for them. I'm running for mayor for the generations that we have yet to come so that we can have a better city that our grandchildren and our grandchildren, grandchildren will be proud to call home. Thank you. Thank you, Shafiq. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, Wendy Hamilton is here and Wendy Hamilton is running for mayor of the city of New Haven. Thank, Thank you for coming tonight, Ms. Hamilton, and tell us what your vision is for the city of New Haven. Good evening. I have lived in New Haven for 40 years many of those years as a Yale nurse, and I too have walked every street in this city. I make two promises for your audience right now. I promise to lower your taxes, and I promise not to expand the airport. Yale and the city government have created a plantation of poverty here. You've got the lowly taxpayers like me, and you've got City Hall that does Yale's bidding. Yale has surrounded itself with an undervalued, undereducated population readily available to do all the low pay, less respected works for the city, for the schools, for the hospitals. 
And now as the economy takes a terrible turn, Yale and City Hall are willing to shift desperate people out of town where they will have to commute so villains can get rich off of city land. <clears throat> this is called gentrification. Yale is no longer a hallowed place of learning, but a financial instrument, apparent even to some of their students. Yale law and science may have helped some of us, but all of this in a community drowning in poverty. We are bankrupt, but don't ask budget director Gormany, he won't tell. Yale, the second richest school worldwide, lives in a town with a terrible public school system. Children here, many damaged by living in sheer poverty in several neglected neighborhoods behind the university and the hospitals, and Yale does nothing, contributes nothing but PR, false promises, and really puny money. Mr. Elliker does a deal with Yale for 50 million over five years while our city budget swells at over 660 million a year. Yale has endowment, the endowment, land, businesses, patents, hospitals, clinics, a publishing company, and much more, maybe a hundred billion dollars worth, maybe more. There are 1,000 millions in one billion. And Yale is not sharing with us. Yale also holds jobs over our heads of further cruelty. Their indifference to this city is staggering, shocking, and grotesque. They treat Singapore better. What mayor will change this? Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Thank you very much. Tom Goldenberg. Tom, would you tell us what your view is for the future of the city of New Haven? Yeah, thank you, Howie. And um, it's, it's really an honor to speak in front of all of you here today. Um, you know, some familiar faces, some people, um, you know, I, I meet for the first time. Um, you know, a little bit about myself. I grew up in, in the New Haven area. I was raised by two local school teachers. And early on, I gained an appreciation for the importance of education. Um, I went to public school in both West Haven and New Haven and studied music. Uh, in my 20s, I lived abroad. I was, in, uh, I was in South India during the tsunami of 2004, and I was involved in some of the rehabilitation efforts uh, to provide things like temporary shelter, food, clothing. I also taught uh, Sanskrit for a number of years while I was there. I came back to, to New Haven and I worked as a uh, restaurant server and bartender downtown. So I was at Tali, Pacifico, Earlum, a number of restaurants. Um, you know, but if I jump ahead to what I've been doing for the last several years, I've been working with city and state governments, um, cities like New Haven, on issues that confront us as challenges or even crises. So I mean public education affordable housing, economic development, some of the things that um, we've heard about already. And you know, to give a sense of some of the projects that I've been involved in, I can cite a few projects that are public knowledge that mckinsey has been involved in and with people that I have worked with. So for example, um, McKinsey wrote the blueprint for New York City streets to provide pedestrian safety and bicycle safety. This was the, um, Plan YC under Mayor Bloomberg, and then the one, one NYC under de Blasio, that has been the basis for New Haven Safe Streets Initiative. Uh, McKinsey was the one that developed a uh, initiative for the state of Ohio called Jobs Ohio that created a million jobs. 
um, and I've worked with that team in another state. Um, McKinsey was behind the Global Alliance for Vaccines, which provide it now provides uh, you know life saving vaccines for pennies on the dollar in developing countries. So these are all the people involved in these projects are people I've worked with on other projects. Um, I, I just say them to give a sense of the type of projects I've been involved in for the last uh, many years. And I'm, I'm very proud of the impact I've been able to, 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 to deliver. And I want to bring that to where I'm from. I'm, I'm from the New Haven area. I, I, I very much feel like this is home for me and I, I want to deliver that impact. And, you know, I just cannot, I can't, I can't not see the potential that this city has having worked on these things. I mean, I've, I've worked with city leaders, I've worked with agency heads. Um, you know, our schools were last in the state last year in chronic absenteeism. We were behind Hartford, Waterbury and Bridgeport, something that honestly, anyone who's been here for a while can't imagine. We used to be an exemplar for urban education in the country. Um, so as mayor, I want to bring our schools back on track. I, 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 like I said, I grew up in a family of local school teachers. I have worked with a half dozen school districts in the state of Connecticut. I've worked on statewide education policy, and I've been vocal on what it actually takes to do to bring us back on track, and I want to do that. I have also spoken about how taxes are hurting our residents. Property taxes went up 40%, that's 40% over the last two years in the Hill, Fairhaven, and Newhallville, all majority Black or Hispanic neighborhoods. This is unacceptable. And it is hurting residents. It is pushing them out of their homes. It is pushing up the price of rent. And so I have publicly said that I am committed to freezing property taxes. Um, I've also spoken about the need for a robust public transportation system where public transportation is convenient and accessible. And I believe that as part of that, of our you know, overall transportation strategy, the rollout of the Tweed expansion was done extremely poorly. Um, I think as, as mayor, right, you know, we need better leadership to address issues like traffic, to address issues like parking. Uh, we, need, we need restrictions on time of flights. We need better support for soundproofing homes which I would be committed to as mayor. And I will never come to a community where residents are upset and say, tough luck. Because you know what? This is a democracy and I will work for the people. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much. Um, mayor Justin Elliker, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Howie. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, how I appreciate you organizing, and uh, it's a lot, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces. Thanks everyone for being here. I also, uh, you know, I, I I did want to thank the other candidates, Wendy, uh, Tom, Liam, Shafiq, uh, for being here. And uh, you know, th there's something great about uh, elections and uh, facilitating a lot of conversations about where we are as a city and where uh, where we should go. Um, I have been mayor, as everyone here knows, for uh, three years, and it's been, uh, as we've all experienced, three quite challenging years. Uh, and I think it's really important not just to talk about the vision, but to talk about a track record and the remarkable progress we as a city have made over these past three years. Uh, I've been laser focused all along on uh, creating a city where everyone has an opportunity to thrive. Everything that our team does focuses around that principle. And when you step back and think about where we were in 2020 and where we are now, uh, I think it's quite remarkable. The budget. Uh, in 2020, we were facing a fiscal crisis. Uh, we were on the precipice. And when you compare that moment to today, fiscal year 23-24 is what we're uh, approaching right now. We have three years of budget surpluses to look back on, a $37 million rainy day fund now. We've had seen our credit agency ratings be upgraded. Uh, we've made incredible progress and why? Uh, number one, we've done expenditure controls, but in many ways, more importantly, thanks to the partnership of so many groups and entities and individuals, the leadership of Senator Looney and our state delegation, we've seen the state increase its funding to the city from $41 million annually in pilot to $90 million annually. We've seen, thanks to 
the advocacy of so many individuals and groups, including Unite Here and others, uh, pushing Yale to do more and increase by the university from an annual payment of $13 million a year to $23 million a year. That's allowed us to stabilize our finances. It's allowed us to invest in the very things that many people care about. It's allowed us to lower the mill rate and help people uh, manage the change in the tax assessment. Uh, it's dramatic, the change that has been made. In public safety, which is my number one priority, we've been implementing a multi-pronged strategy that focuses on cops, it focuses on strategic partnerships, it focuses on violence interruption programs, it focuses on technology, and it focuses on investing in our community, things that are known to work. And it's everything from opening a re-entry welcome center to welcome returning citizens, to expanding ShotSpotter, to uh, uh, purchasing a NIBIN machine to help us with ballistic investigation, to the number of cameras that have been installed around the city, to taking 92 guns off the street this year alone compared to last year when it was 55 that we took off the, the street at this time of year. We've solved seven homicides already, but more importantly, we're making investments in our community so people have more opportunities to thrive and opportunities to choose a different life. On education, we have made significant progress as well. We're working to address absenteeism. Uh, we've dropped that number significantly since last year. We've implemented a historic increase in teacher salaries. We've finished that contract uh, and uh, come to a, a, a real solid agreement with the teachers on an increase in salaries so we can retain and attract more teachers to our system. My budget proposes an $8 million increase to the public education system. In addition, we're investing more in an after-school and summer volunteer tutoring program. We're working to open seven new youth and community centers across the city. And I think most exciting, we're about to announce a new superintendent uh, of uh, our schools. And this is a real opportunity for us to, um, to start fresh and build on the work of Dr. Tracy and her team, but also build on a lot of new ideas and excitement. On housing, since taking office in 2020, we've added over 900 new affordable units, and we have over 900 in the pipeline, and some of those are deeply affordable, and some of those are affordable as uh, classified by the state. We've invested millions to support emergency housing. We've implemented new policies to require developments to have a percentage of affordable housing. We've cracked down and continue to increase our crackdown on absentee landlords uh, with increased fines and uh, re-envisioning of our lead inspection regi regime. We have done so much. And on quality of life, we've made a ton of progress as well. Uh, we've stopped the East Coasting event that's uh, really had a huge impact on the East Shore. Uh, we've increased fines on dirt bikes and ATVs to make sure that we can confiscate those vehicles. Uh, we're about to submit to the Board of Alders an increase in fines for loudspeakers that have been plaguing, in particular, the East Shore neighborhood, particularly from Long Wharf. Uh, and we've done a lot more. These issues that we're facing as a city were not created yesterday. They've been decades in the making, and they can't be solved in a day or a year or even three years. But when you step back and look at the remarkable progress we have made, I think that we should be proud. I always say we have more work to do. We all know that's the case, but it's important to underscore that we have come a long way as a city. We've got a long way to go, but we've come a long way. And I appreciate everyone's partnership in this work that we have ahead of us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now there's a button on your Zoom that says reactions. And if you press that button, a bunch of emojis will come up. And if you click on the one that says raise hand, you're a gold hand will show up in the corner, just the way it did on mine. So if you want to have any questions uh, for any of the candidates or for Mayor Elliker, uh, please raise your hand or wave at the screen or do something <clears throat> so we can we can get your attention. Uh, let's see who we have. Joe, Ro Joe Riolito, is that a, waving your hand to ask a question? You could unmute yourself, Joe, and ask your question. Uh, no, Howie. Oh, I was looking for that button we're talking about. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I, I, I want to thank everybody. I, I certainly want to thank Mayor Elliker, 
is a job can't imagine why anybody would want to do it it's it's a it's a tough job i lived in the city of new york all of my life this job just seems harder than that and and, and i'll be damned if i know why but I, I really appreciate everybody coming here tonight we have 80 participants in this meeting that's significant for the east shore it's significant for the city of new haven and it shows i think that if we do work together all of us the individuals the neighborhood groups the government, police department, fire department, everybody else, that we can make the city a, a better city. I'm going to live here for the rest of my life, and and I just want to see, uh, I, I want to see us thrive. And if we do, it's going to just be better and better and better. Lisa Bassani, how are you, Lisa? Hi, thanks, Howie. Um, I just have a quick question um, for the mayor. Um, mayor, when you ran in 2019. Um, it was very clear that you were in favor of the tweet expansion, but you were in front of the, the Ward 18 Democratic Committee um, and made some promises around being attended to the environmental impacts of any expansion, and, and you have not lived up to that. Um, on April 1st, there were hundreds of people who attended the one public hearing for the tweet environmental assessment. Um, I know Liam and Shafiq were there. I'm not sure about Tom and Wendy. Um, you were not there, and I'm curious if you can explain to everybody on this call why you were not there and why you didn't think that was that that warranted your presence. Thanks for your time. So, so first of all, I disagree with your assessment. I lost you, Mr. Mayor. You're on mute, Justin. Justin, yeah. sorry. Uh, sure, thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, first of all, I, I disagree with your assessment. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember the exact words that you used, but you know something around I dropped the ball on environmental issues and so. Um, that, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, what I said, and I have been consistent all along, uh, is that, and prior to running for mayor, that there are a number of issues that I think were important to address prior to approving any expansion of the airport, vehicle traffic issues environmental issues, you are right. The financial subsidy to the airport uh, was another significant one as well. Uh, we've eliminated the financial subsidy that previously was a million dollars per year. Uh, we have, when we move the terminal to the East Haven side, which is more appropriate for commercial traffic, we will significantly reduce the traffic impact on the neighborhood on the New Haven side. And on the environmental issue, uh, I think this is a complicated question. So, for example, there's a lot of stormwater issues around the entire neighborhood that are impacted by uh, the low lying, not just Tweed, but a lot of the houses. Uh, with the expansion of the wetlands, there will be a two to one expansion of the wetlands with the project when the terminal moves to the East Haven side. There will be a significant increase in the capacity, the holding capacity of water to address stormwater issues. Climate. I think climate is a legitimate uh, a question that we need to, to talk about. And it's undoubtable that air traffic uh, increases the impact on climate change, but we can't look at the airport alone as an island. And the city's doing so much more on climate. Uh, we've put $5 million of ARPA funds into climate. We've created a climate office, identified a climate director, we are electrifying our vehicle fleet. We are electrifying our buildings. Uh, we will be implementing uh, home energy improvements throughout the city and a lot more. So I, I think it's it's not uh, accurate to uh, indicate or to say that uh, there hasn't been the focus on the environment. Uh, as, you know, specifically on the testimony for uh, the uh, environmental assessment that was two weekends ago. I was there earlier in the day. I submitted written testimony. We had multiple staff members testifying. And I think that anyone that says that I am not available or not accessible or not present has not seen my activity over the last three years. I try to show up to everything. I have, as you know, Lisa, been in front of uh, many community meetings that have been focused on Tweed. Those have been hard meetings because people have been really emotional and frustrated understandably. Uh, and I, everyone has my cell phone and I do my best to respond to everyone. Uh, so I think I have really followed through with my commitment uh, to be accessible and I will continue to do that. 
Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are there any other questions for the candidates? I don't see any hands up. Uh, Mr. Mayor, could I ask you a question about the um, uh, drug treatment center situation? And, and, and I about the, you know more about that than certainly than I. But I think sure. So there's multiple treatment yeah. centers. Uh, isn't there? Isn't there? An application? Yeah, I'm sorry. There's an application for a new one. Is that what, what's what's the status? Sure. So I think you're talking about the App Foundation, I am. and the uh, uh, the App Foundation currently has two sites in New Haven. One is at One Long Wharf Drive, and the other is on Congress Avenue. And App uh, Foundation was uh, purchased a building on Dixwell Avenue, an old uh, school and was intending to move their Long Wharf operations to Dixwell Avenue. The community uh, or living around the school was very understandably concerned about that proposal. And we have been working with App to find another location that would be more appropriate, not as close to a residential area and uh, more appropriate for uh, methadone treatment in, uh, in New Haven. This is an important treatment that many people in New Haven rely on. The APT has over a thousand uh, clients from New Haven that rely on their services. And uh, we have our, our proposed location is where, where we're calling the Gateway District uh, on Sargent Drive, basically adjacent to where APT currently is on One Long Wharf Drive. Uh, and we've ensured, and I've insisted, that as a part of this proposal, in a much more commercial and more appropriate area, that App will discontinue in addition their methadone treatment on the Congress Avenue site. There's been a lot of issues associated with the Congress Avenue site, in part uh, because of the existence of App's methadone treatment at that location. So our goal is to not just ensure that App can provide services to residents and that it doesn't impact a heavily residential area, but also to discontinue the methadone treatment that is going on at the Congress Avenue site to also address the issues around that site as well. Does that answer your question, Howie? It does. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Okay. Lisa Malone has a question. Lisa? Um, actually, Howie, may I chime in there? Because I, I've written pretty extensively about that topic and would like to say a few words. If Lisa will give you the floor. You have it. Okay. She said yes. Go ahead. That's okay, Howie? Yes. Go on. So a couple things. I, you mentioned that the drug treatment centers, the, the specifically the methadone clinics. I spend uh, a number of days talking to uh, patients, staff. I talk to, um, in, including illegal drug dealers. I, I talk to them as well. I talk to uh, residents. And what I can say is this, we do not need a five-year plan for getting a methadone clinic to move from a location that is 300 feet from a school that was built before the methadone clinic came there. So that's point number one that I have made emphatically. Uh, so the mayor's plan is just, I think it's a it's disrespectful to these communities, specifically the Hill and New Hallville. And please allow me to finish before uh, I would like to give the mayor a chance to respond to this. But not only that, but then the APT Foundation purchased a uh, an old school in New Hallville, a majority black neighborhood, the mayor in City Hall did not even inform the elected official there. It, and for me, it is just infuriating how you can disrespect communities like this and not include them in the conversation. A third thing I will say, it's not just methadone clinics. In New York City, they've been experimenting with sites where people can shoot up drugs legally. And I, in my conversations, I have learned that Justin Elliker's administration has talked to uh, other organizations about this with no knowledge given to the public. And so I've called for transparency, whatever the city wants to do, the, the residents of any community, and, and that goes for all of our communities. This is not a case where one community has special rights and the other doesn't. That's what I wanna be and advocate for all these communities because Residents have to be part of this conversation and they are not. There is no transparency and it is disrespectful. And that's why Mayor Elliker does not have the support of almost all the people that he started with. And, and I, I'm just gonna say that I have called for solutions. 
I have called for zoning changes to be made to make sure that we learn from the good examples. If you go to West Haven on Front Avenue, the methadone clinic there is an exceptional place. There is no quality of life issues. And while the mayor may have a plan five years from now, we cannot wait. So I have called for action immediately. As mayor, I will make changes from day one. I am not gonna give people the runaround and say that we have a plan that has no actual uh, date to be, to be known of. So Thank that's you. what I would like to say. It, it is something I'm very passionate about because I spend a lot of time talking to residents. I talk to patients. I talk to staff of App Foundation who say the same thing I just said. So uh, I just wanted to say that and I would love to hear the mayor's response. Well, I'm going to ask the mayor if he'd like to make a response, Mr. Mayor. So, so Mr. Goldberg, you said a lot. You said a lot. Um, and I have been talking, I too have been talking res for with residents, um, not just over the past few months when I've been running, when I've been running for mayor, but for many years, even prior to the three years that I have been mayor in all of these neighborhoods. And a number of the things that you said were either inaccurate or not framing the picture in an appropriately fair way. Just like you don't have control over a private entity, I too don't have control over a private entity. We can't just tell APT to move out of their site on Congress Avenue, as much as some people might like. This is a private entity that owns that building and legally has the right to be there. And as Nice as it would be to stand on the sidelines and say that when I'm mayor, I can fix all these things and everyone should believe me. The reality is you just can't do that. You have to put in the hard work. Specific to Congress Avenue, we haven't been just sitting around, sir. We haven't been saying we're going to fix things in five years, but we have worked very hard with the community. And I encourage you to talk with some of the members of the community management team, the district manager, Sergeant Sanders there, Lieutenant Marshall, who preceded Sergeant Sanders about the work that has been done. The details of putting in fencing around the school, putting in lighting, additional cameras, trimming the trees for more visibility, having police officers there in the morning, in the evening when drop off and pickup times happen. There's a lot of work that goes into these things and to stand on the sidelines and say, I would fix it all is just not accurate and not fair to the people that are doing this work. On Dixwell Avenue, App purchased that building unilaterally without the city's knowledge. And so to say the mayor didn't let anyone know, we didn't have control over that. The community came out and said, we don't want this building here. And I have been working very hard with leaders of the New Hallville Hampton Strong Group, met with them very regularly. I encourage you to speak directly with many of those members to confirm that because we have been working very, very hard to address that problem. I'll note that APT has not moved to that site because we are working with APT to find an additional site. And I, I want to finish by underscoring that what's unfortunate about this conversation is there are so many people in our community that are struggling with opioid use disorder. And it is important for us to not treat this as some sort of pariah, not criminalize it, not focus on the negativity, but really work together as a community to help people who need help. That's what we're doing here. And to stand on the sideline and criticize people as not being transparent and being so negative. It's just not respectful to so many people that are working very, very hard to address this issue and help people that are really struggling in our community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Lisa Malone, you have a question. Yes, yeah, so this question actually can go out to any one of the candidates that would like to give a response. You know, we certainly have significant challenges in New Haven and we've had challenges for the last three to five years minimum. COVID was the beginning of our schools are failing, the streets are violent, you know, COVID was the beginning, we got all this money. We just seem to keep throwing money after problems. Um, Mr. Mayor, you said another $8 million in the school board budget. You know, we just keep throwing money, throwing money, let's find more money, let Yale give us money, let's pay more money for this, pay more money for that. We're now, I think, going on our third superintendent. Every superintendent we get for the schools is going to save the day and make all the changes we need. We're going to increase the salary. None of this happens overnight other than saying, I'm going to throw money at the problem or I'm going to have a consultant and pay them $50,000 to tell us what to do. Who has an actual answer? Not pipe dreams. You know, we've been listening to pipe dreams for a long time. 
Our children are our future. If we don't educate our children, we don't get our children off the street, we don't get our children away from the line of fire to be shot, you know, come on, moms are going in the street because their 16-year-old is shot. This is a sin. And, and money's not solving the problem. So we can balance our budget, talk money, pretend we have a lot of money, pretend we can throw more money at problems. Money doesn't solve the problem. How are we going to get the right people to do the job? Maybe, maybe we need to hire different people. I'm looking for an answer from, like I said, any one of the candidates here. Other well, than let me go down, down, down the list. It's I great. understand. I understand it's campaign season and all the promises will come out, but let's try to be a little. Let's talk reality if we could. Let me ask all of the candidates if they would like to spend a couple of minutes uh, commenting on Lisa's uh, statements. Uh, let me start with Liam again. Liam, sure thing. Uh, thanks, Howie and Lisa. Thank you so much for your question. Um, you know, I think there is, I, I think your question has so many layers into it. Um, there's both the question of like what we do with the money and then how are we going to solve the problems? Um, and then how are we going to get the people to do the work that we, we need? Um, I think part of it is having a vision of what, what you need and want to be done with the city. So first of all, we have a housing issue in New Haven where we do not have enough homes for people. And we need to really fully overhaul our zoning code and rethink how we are doing housing to bring in more housing. Otherwise, as I said in the opening, that we are going to see more homelessness and we're just going to see rates go up. So what we're dealing with when we have a less than 2% vacancy rate in the city is means that landlords can do whatever they want. They can take over people. And so we need to really fully like go in and make change and be very clear that this is what we want to do with an administration. I think we also need to take much more bolder change. And so we need to look at a lot of properties that the city owns and repurpose them towards housing, whether we put them in private hands or whether we have them publicly owned lands that, that can be used um, to build housing on. There's a numerous ways to do that, uh, but this needs to be like kind of number one issue to address the issue of housing. And it's being very clear with the public about what that means and having a clear vision of what you want to do there. So I've been working on this for many years. It's been a huge issue for me. The second things you're talking about is like getting it done. And particularly like you're talking about schools um, as one of the things I heard you bring up, Lisa, and you can interrupt me if you want to like tell me I'm off or you want me to hit another topic. But um, I think it is really important for whoever is the leader of this city to, or is the leader of any organization who works with any organization to really be able to connect and listen to the people who are working for you, with you on these issues, and then be able to rally them to do the tough work that we need to do. So it's true that money will not solve everything. So I hear from a lot of teachers that there is a lot of non-monetary benefits that would make them stay. So for example, we've had two teachers here in New Haven who live in New Haven, who want to stay in New Haven, who were teaching here in New Haven, want to make their whole lives and their teaching lives be about the city. They were transferred from their classrooms the day before school was going to start. A teacher works all, I, mean, I come from a family of teachers. My mom's a public school teacher. My sister's a public school teacher. My brother-in-law's a public school teacher. I mean, the, these people work all summer long to prepare for the school year. They will roll with us if we need them to do difficult things, but you can't walk in and ask them to transfer the day before school starts. So part of this is just like really good management. So what we see here, and, and this is kind of going across the board here in New Haven, we're letting our teachers down with the way that we're managing them. We're letting uh, our commissions down with the way that we're managing them. We have a civilian review board that was created under this administration that is literally falling apart. Um, we have a library that is being like reorganized into a whole nother department and the head of the library system wasn't even contacted about this. We have a management issue kind of across the board. We had a new uh, violence prevention coordinator who resigned after three months because they felt there was no investment or direction in the office. You need a leader who is really knows how to work with folks and knows how to inspire them to take on the, the difficult work that needs to be done. I did that when I took over CVLC, we had a six figure deficit. We had the lowest paid legal attorneys, legal aid attorneys in the state and we couldn't provide our, family, our, our attorneys families healthcare. This needed to change. And what I, I had to have a frank talk with the staff and say, I want to do this for you. I'm going to do this for you. 
you need to please hang in with me while we try and make these changes. By the time I left, we had a six-figure surplus. We expanded to two new locations around the state. We grew our staff and we provided family health care and we pegged their pay to the median income for legal aid attorneys in the state. It just takes a manager who is dedicated to doing this. I do want to say one last thing, and I'm going to turn it over to Howard then after this. It doesn't mean, though, that money doesn't matter. I do think that money matters significantly here. I know there are many places where we can rein in some of our spending, and I do think we are wasteful in some parts, in some places of the Department of Ed or other places in the city. But realistically, New Haven, uh, a study done by the Connecticut Mirror found in 2018, we ranked 41st in spending per capita towards our residents. That's why we don't get a lot of the results that we want. So if you look at the other towns near us, they spend upwards towards 60% of their income, and they spend much more. They spend like up towards like th uh, 40 to 60% or 80%, some of them, more than we do per capita on residents. But 60% of their total budget goes towards their schools. And like 30% of our budget goes towards our schools. And so it's really no surprise that we're not making the changes that we need. So revenue is still a big issue. And so I do agree with you on, on so much of what you're bringing up, but I don't want it to get lost that money is not part of the solution. Money is clearly part of the solution that we need, we need here and looking for new revenue ways. Thank you, Leon. I appreciate it. Shafiq, do you have anything to add to this? Yes. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for your, your question. I did hear um, some concerns around finances in that. So um, if I recall, it was a, a finance heavy on your question. The one, as you, I think you said, let's not throw good money after bad money. Um, and I would say this, um, you know, Stephen Covey in his book calls it Trust and Inspire. I love that book, Trust and Inspire. And in the book, talks about leadership and type, different types of leaders. I am a trust and inspire leader. I am the type of leader, I like to give people all the resources that they need to be successful, to successfully get the job done. That's what I learned in my career, 21 and a half years as a civil servant, as a public servant, trusting people, giving them the resources, and then inspiring them, bringing people together, no matter what your race is or your class or your politics. At the end of the day, it's only important that we get things done. That is the type of leader that I am. That is the type of leader that I plan to be as the mayor. And you know the other thing about that type of leadership? Sometimes you have to make a tough decision and stand on that decision. And a tough decision that needs to be made in the city of New Haven is we need a fiscal audit. A fiscal audit of every single department in the city of New Haven. And I can guarantee you this. I can guarantee you this. I'm not gonna run myself out there in false promises and say, I'll never raise taxes because I'm not the mayor right now. And I don't know what the city finances look like. But what I will find out when I get there is to do a fiscal audit of every single department down to the pencil, pen, crayon, and paperclip to see exactly what do we own as a city what is it costing us? And are we spending the taxpayers' dollars the way it needs to be spent for the betterment of moving this city forward? I can tell you right now, the city has take-home cars for different departments. And I see those cars riding around the city at night from departments that are not emergency responding departments at nine o'clock at night <laughs> at restaurants. And I ask myself, and it drives me nuts, with gas almost at $4 a gallon. Why is somebody that is not an emergency unit, like a police officer or the fire chief or something like that, has a take-home car? And when we think about what it's costing us in gas, maintenance, tires, we're self-insured. I mean, these are a significant cost to the city. So doing a fiscal audit of all the departments is going to be the best way that we can account for all of the money that we collect in taxes, the money that we're receiving from Yale, the money that we have in our capital project funds, right? This is important. So that's my priority to you as voters. And that will be my priority to you as a taxpayer because I understand it. Remember, my mother, $800 a month, she can't afford her taxes to go up. Thank you.
Thank you, Shafiq. Wendy Hamilton. Your collar <laughs> crime scene, which contributes to all the other crime. Money usually is the answer, but I will cut spending, stupid spending, and spending on non-essentials, and I will raise revenue, but not by raising taxes on us, the homeowner, the condo owner, et cetera. Our pensions need to redo certain city employees who are survival, the disaster folks, the fire, the cops, the teachers, they will get their raises. But I am going after where the money is. Yale, Ocean Pike, Mandy, Matthew Harp, Wynn Stanley, and all the developers who are getting away with our land for cheap and charging market rate rents. Market rate means you can't afford this. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm not done. I read the budget books, the two last budget books. We are bankrupt. Liam Brennan said we're a six-figure deficit. We have a 10-figure deficit. I wrote a letter last month to the FBI. There's a big FBI building four blocks from my condo. And I asked for forensic accounting investigation because obviously nobody knows how much we have and where the hell it is. But it's going to the wrong folks right now. I'm done. Thank you. Tom Goldenberg. Thank you. Um, I think the, the question is a very important one about education. I, I think I mentioned it's something I'm very passionate about. And I'm not here just to point fingers. I'm here to offer solutions. And I, I encourage everyone, I've actually written pretty extensively about what we should do for education. There's, if you look in the online in the New Haven Register under my name, you'll find two op-eds. One about kind of in general, what are some policies we should adapt to address teacher shortages and school engagement? And the other is how we can engage parents more. But I'll say a couple of things. I, I absolutely agree. I think it's finances alone are not going to solve the issue. And I, I do agree that there is a leadership crisis. Absolutely. Um, and we need a mayor who one who is willing to be bold and to be a leader on the board of ed and to be a leader with our district leadership and to actually fight for policies that are going to help so some of the things i've called for is to expand a program to make it easier to be a certified teacher from a paraprofessional i know that the city has been rolling out a pilot of this i would like to expand this and this is something i've worked on with some national organizations on I think that we need more transparency into our school's performance. We saw Eileen Tracy get up in front of the Board of Alders, and when we had the worst chronic absenteeism, there was no reflection on what the schools could be doing better. It, it seems like everything was just placed at the feet of COVID and parents. But we do know that schools do play a role. We should be able to see what are student survey responses for uh, student engagement, how do they feel about the feedback that they get in the classroom? Do they feel safe going to the school? And currently, other school districts offer this in a way that we currently don't, do not. Um, currently, about only, I, I, it's le definitely less than half. It could be as low as only eight schools having a regularly meeting PTA or PTO organization. And I've talked to people that have talked to district leadership that say they like it that way because more parent engagement means more work for them. And that is just unacceptable. I want every school to have a functioning parent organization that should be involved in our school. And that's how we used to do it. And we need a, a leader in City Hall that will advocate for teachers, that will advocate for parents and advocate for the students. Um, so those are just a few of my ideas. I would be very happy to chat more um, I'm at Tom at TomForNewHaven.com if anyone wants to talk more about this or other policies. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Mr. Mayor? Um, 
So a lot of things were said. Let's maybe t- take a breath here. Um, leadership isn't about standing on the sidelines and being negative. Leadership is about doing things uh, and doing the work, even if it's hard. Um, a, a, a number of things that were said, I've talked to people who have talked to people who've talked to people, you know, I, I'm not sure how to respond to that. There was a comment about of our school funding, only 30% go to directly to the schools. Uh, completely, completely inaccurate. Uh, I think that we need to be factual here. The city is not bankrupt. We have a lot of financial challenges, but we are not bankrupt. Um, so let's have, like, have a pr- productive conversation here and agree we have a long, long way to go with New Haven Public Schools. I'm a dad of uh, two kids. One of them is four and is going uh, to public schools next year, and the other one is eight and is in a New Haven Public School on Grand Avenue. Uh, and so I experienced this firsthand, not just as mayor, but as a dad. And money is important. It's not the only thing, but it's important. And we spend uh, around $17,000 per student in our school district. A, a district like New Canaan spends $23,000. We need to spend more on our children, not just throwing it away. We don't do that. But right now, teachers are using their own money to buy supplies. And that's just not right. There was a reference about uh, teachers in schools and not having enough teachers in schools. We, like many cities around the nation, are facing a real challenge around teacher recruitment and retention, which is one of a number of reasons why we have increased teacher salaries to be more competitive with other districts and to give our teachers the dignity and respect that they deserve uh, because they're working in very hard circumstances. Uh, And the uh, historically, uh, the te- our teachers have been some of the lowest paid in the state, but we also need to do more, right? Uh, this, we're adopting the science of reading to ensure that, and we've just chosen a new curriculum that is based in research and science to ensure that our children's literacy cor- scores improve. We're opening seven youth and community centers around the city in old dilapidated buildings and opening up those buildings for nonprofits to use so that it is a more cost-effective way for us to increase programming, oftentimes nonprofits are able to provide that programming but don't need a space without spending a significant amount of additional money. We're doing a lot more, but there's this is work that we have to do. It's not productive to be all negative about it. Uh, and, I, and I do think it's important to underscore that money does matter. And, and historically, New Haven Public Schools have not had the kind of money that they need to provide the, the services and support for our, our children. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Patricia Kane. You have a question. I need you to unmute, Patricia King. I think I've accomplished that. First of all, Howie, I want to thank you so much for this format tonight because I think of all the, uh, whether you call them debates, interviews, discussions, whatever, we've had in past campaigns, they've largely been controlled by the press and very time limited. I feel like this is really the best opportunity for all these people who put themselves out there for this office to really expand on their answers and not be cut off. And it, it also, I just feel like we're getting a lot more detail and that's very welcome. I hope other people feel that way. Now on to my quick question. Is anyone familiar with New Haven's 10 year plan to end chronic homelessness. I have a copy of it here. Has anybody read it? Any of the candidates? It's interesting because this topic has been around for a long time. So my question is, but it's dated 2007, but the committee report was actually 2005 and it's quite detailed. Be happy to provide copies to anyone who wants one. So the second part of my question is, will you as candidates, if elected, pursue a policy of evicting unhoused people and destroying their possessions? The next part is, if not, what would you do? All right, let me turn this address to all the candidates. Thanks, Patricia. Let me go one at a time. Mr. Mayor, I want to take this one first. Sure. So Patricia is referring to uh, an encampment that uh, was on the West River where there were approximately 15 people staying in tents. Uh, and they had been staying there for around two to three years throughout the pandemic. 
Um, over the years, our outreach workers and our nonprofit partners have regularly engaged with the individuals that were there to support them to provide uh, uh, help and assistance uh, with the goal of rehousing people. And by the way, uh, the city of New Haven does more than any other municipality in the entire state of Connecticut for the unhoused. We put $1.4 million into homeless support, direct, direct support uh, for the unhoused. We rehoused in partnership with our nonprofits over 1,500 people during the pandemic. So this is something that is very, very important to the city. And I think that we should be proud of the city's track record here. Specific to this encampment, there were things going on in the encampment that were not safe. There was propane uh, uh, heating in tents that were highly flammable. Uh, there was a construction of a shower. Uh, there was human waste, right at both of those right adjacent to the West River and various other issues. We worked hard to, uh, to encourage and help support the, the individuals camping there to address those health and safety issues. Uh, we gave them multiple notifications that if they did not address the health and safety issues that we would need to remove the encampment. When those were not addressed, we gave them more time to remove their belongings. We work with the United Way of Greater New Haven to provide space for uh, their belongings. Uh, the Compass team helped them move some of their things. And most importantly, every single individual that was at that encampment had the, a bed available at Columbus House. So we worked very, very hard to address an issue uh, and to ensure that people were safe. You know, at the end of the day, we've got to ensure that people are safe. Uh, and after all of that work, we removed the encampment. Now, I presume the other, other candidates are going to say how awful and unethical this was, but to say those things when Velma George and Seanette on our homeless advocacy team work day in and day night, day in and day out to help provide and support people. They're working so hard because they're passionate about their jobs. It's just not right. We care deeply about this issue and the city of New Haven does so much to help support uh, individuals that are struggling with homelessness. Howie, may I respond to one thing the mayor said that I believe is incorrect? Of course. Some of the people who were evicted that day said that they were offered housing three months down the road. The Columbus House is filled to capacity, and there was no housing immediately available to some of the people evicted that day. So that's the only correction I'll offer. So that's not accurate. Uh, and I, I encourage you to talk with the director of Columbus House to confirm that information. A number of the individual, individuals chose not to accept the housing. Uh, one of the individuals ha found long-term permanent housing. Another individual lived in Florida and wanted a flight back to Florida. And we facilitated, there's funding available, not through tax dollars to help uh, pay for that person to fly back to Florida. A number of individuals chose to remain outside living in someone's backyard. So there was a number of individuals that chose different options, but everyone had a bed available to them. I wouldn't stand here and say things that are not accurate and that I didn't confirm. Tom Goldenberg on this issue, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Patricia, for bringing this up. I think it is a, an important issue. Um, the housing is, is something I have also been passionate about. I, I on the board of the downtown evening soup kitchen, which um, has a large unhoused population. So I've also worked with uh, affordable housing developers and it's it is a it it it's true. It's not just in New Haven. This is a national really tragic tragic crisis, I would say. And um, you know, I, I was on the bus, I was going on some of the buses and I talked to a woman 65 years old, had worked all her life. She has cancer um, and she's not able to get any housing assistance. She went, she's going for surgery and she doesn't know where she's going to go when she's, um, she comes out. I talked to other people that were 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 people on the wait list for housing assistance. Now, I, I will be honest with you. This is not something that I can fully place at the feet of Mayor Elliker because this is requires statewide and national wide attention. Um, I believe, it's my firm belief that uh, housing is a human right. It's not a reward. Uh, and I'm a firm believer of the housing first approach that 
um, the way that we currently have food assistance where everyone quali whoever qualifies gets it, that is how we should have housing assistance. So I'm a big I'm a big proponent of the voucher system where people can choose where they live rather than kind of concentrating in certain areas. I think that um, as a state, we need someone who can advocate to expand the voucher system. And, and I wanna be that person and I will pressure our legislators. I will pressure our US delegation to advance policies that expand the voucher program. Um, so that's that what I would say, but you know, to Mayor Elliker's point, I think that the encampments is not an answer. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that we need a solution that there, there's going to be issues with that as well. That's not really a humane or a good policy either. So I, I think that we need to work to create more support for housing first policies and, um, and, and, and funding for such initiatives at the state. And we're, we're really not doing a good job there as a state or a country. And that's something that I want to advocate for. Thank you, Tom. Wendy, on the housing issue? You have to unmute, Wendy. You have to unmute. Okay, yeah. My IT guy is here with me. Thank Just you. On the housing issue, please. Currently, there is no affordable housing and no hope for the homeless. I know many of them. Uh, there are at least 50 guys, 50 older men living in the train station, which is run by one particular man who works for the city parking authority. He kicks them out at 1 a.m. and they stay out until 4 a.m. Um, and this is ongoing. I spent a month trying to talk him out of that. I agree with Goldenberg on the housing first approach, which I will use. Many of you in the East Shore will not be happy to hear that I support tent cities, small housing, more shelters, and I do have a solution for affordable housing. You are all welcome to phone or email me. I actually answer all of my emails, unlike other people I won't mention. Um, Mowing down that tent city of non-criminal citizens was a big mistake for the mayor and the community solutions team. They're going to be uh, big changes with that community, the, the community help development, whatever you want to call them. Um, you do not uh, destroy, uh, that place was viable, organized, those were non-criminals, and I spent about $2,000 on two of them, including bus tickets, so they could get the hell out of here. I bought them food and clothing, and I know Pat Kane is um, wonderful about caring. I do care. And I'm definitely going to do something about it. We have over a thousand homeless living on the street right now. I'm familiar with many of them. Thank you, Wendy. Shafiq, anything on the housing issue, please? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Pat Kane, for your, for your question as well. Uh, I actually, when I was the alder, I sat on the housing, the Homeless Commission. And, you know, I did some follow-up research just to make sure that I'm on par and the current budget for the homeless is 1.4 million dollars that budget has not been increased in over seven years Pat has indicated already that this is a 2005 2007 plan as an alder when I was assigned to that commission I remember the uh people on the commission said, thank God we got Shafiq. Now we're going to be able to get a breakthrough. And it was almost this ongoing sentiment that we feel throughout the city, that in the city of New Haven, in order to get something, you've got to fight for it. In order to get something that you've paid for, you've got to advocate for it. It's just, there's just no, no regular show up, do what's required, and these services will be delivered. 
$1.4 million is the budget. It has not been increased in seven years. Currently right now, there's approximately 543 homeless or housing insecure individuals living in all of New Haven County. So the first thing that I would do as a mayor regarding this issue is revise our homeless policy. It needs to obviously be updated and brought into the now. The other thing that needs to happen in doing so, we need to really try to identify how many people in housing need around homelessness do we have in the city of New Haven? It's hard to not see almost on every street corner as you enter into New Haven or exit out of New Haven, there is an individual holding a sign, asking for food, asking for money um, in, in need. It's hard to not see that. It's hard to not see that when you go downtown to our green, that I grew up as a little boy. I used to love going down to the green. There's a little water fountain right there right at the corner of um, church and chapel. It's not working anymore. And I used to love to drink out of that water fountain. But it's hard to not see all of the bus stops that as the sun sets, they become temporary homeless shelters. That if you walk down there, whether you're catching a bus or you're walking by, you can smell the stench of the urine in the feces. This is what we've left our residents having to struggle and be in survival mode. Because I'm out there and I went to the camp that day prior to it being demolished. And I didn't know anybody there. But getting out of the car, sliding through the mud, your shoes sinking down almost three to four inches in mud. It was freezing absolutely cold. When we went on the other side of the fence, I met a gentleman named Paul. Paul had his tent on two crates on the, the pallets, as everybody did. And they were struggling. I, it, it, was, it, was, it was painful. It, I mean, I, it, it was painful. And all I could think of, here's a young man, this could be my kid. This could be my nephew. And what can we give? So we definitely have to come up with a better policy. There's only 100 beds in the city of New Haven. There's only 100 beds. In the Columbus House, it's a great facility. As a police officer, I sent people there. I paid for rooms in the past. But you have to call 211. So when you approach somebody in the corner, like I often do, and try to get them services, when somebody shows up to give them a service, they've got to sign them up on 211. And then 211 says, we will call them on what? What are you going to call them on? They have no phone. So that system needs to be shored up a whole lot better to connect the resources for folks in the city so that we can get people off the street corners from out of these park benches and that we don't have people living in absolute destitute in a city. I mean, this is one of the most, it was said, New York Times said, this is one of the 52 most places to visit in the world, that's not a country, that's our planet. And here we can't even find a solution to get people from not having to sleep in six inch frozen mud in our own great city. Thank you, Shafiq. Liam on the housing issue, please. Sure, uh, thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate it. Um, Patricia, thank you so much for this, this question, uh, this important issue. Uh, it's true that New Haven does do more than most towns. I mean, I think we see that. We see that in a lot of issues. I think the reality is though we need to do as much as we can with the reality that we are faced with. So I used to find this when we would advocate for affordable housing, people would say, and when I talk about affordable housing, I'm not just talking about subsidized housing, I'm talking about just housing affordability, all the policies that will make housing more affordable. But people would say to you, oh, New Haven's got more affordable housing than anywhere around. Yes, but we still have a need. And if, if we have something within our control, we need to do what we can to address that issue. So here on, on homelessness, homelessness is essentially at its core, a housing problem. There are intersections clearly with mental health issues, with addiction issues. But what you see when you look around the country that um, places that have high, hot real estate markets where there, where there is a tight real estate market, that is where we have higher rates of homelessness, uh, not necessary places that have 
higher rates of mental illness. For example, Alabama has higher rates of mental illness than Connecticut and then New Haven, but they have lower rates of homelessness because housing there is cheap. So one, it will not solve all our problems, but one of the most important things that New Haven can do is to promote as much as possible housing affordability. And so, and that is a kind of all of the above approach from subsidized housing, more investment of public resources to also redoing our whole zoning code to allow for smaller places to be built, different places to be built, like single room occupancy places where someone can just rent a room and live in it rather than have a whole home. So to really take on this issue, we have to think about housing writ large um, and address the fundamental like underlying issues of housing affordability here in the city and take that on to make a real dent in the issue. Thank you, Liam. Uh, Anthony DePonte has a question. Ann Stris, you'll be next. Uh, Anthony? All right, let me unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're fine. All right. So uh, okay. this, uh, somebody's talking over me, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. I feel you got to mute little somebody little else, little. Howie. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So uh, this mess, uh, question is for uh, Shafiq. Uh, first, I want to say I'm also the son of a letter carrier. I'm also a fourth generation New Haven resident. And I have a simple question, you know, uh, being a New Haven resident, I've always thought that um, there should be a, a mayor for New Haven from New Haven. Our last mayor who was that was John Stefano. Prior to him was uh, Biagio Delito. Obviously, he worked for the police department also. So you kind of kind of fit that role. This is a tough one for you though, maybe or maybe not. We've all been talking about the majority of the city and we're gonna talk a little bit about our own neighborhood, especially 17 and 18. Where do you stand on Tweed and the airport? Shafiq? Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anthony, for, for that question. Where do I stand? Uh, January the 27th of this year, I wrote the FAA and petitioned to them requesting an environmental impact study. Um, I joined with Senator Looney and State Representative Al Pialillo um, to advocate for this in writing because I understand that the residents have concerns around this airport, around the noise and the parking and how the fumes from the plane and the exhaust will have an impact on the wetlands. When I was a young kid growing up, one of my fondest memories growing up in New Haven, and I was born to a teenage mom, was I love to fish. And my mother brought me a bamboo pole and it came in sections in this little blue thing. And she took me out to where? To the lighthouse. I know exactly where the spot was. It was the spot right left to the concession stand, right over to the corner where the old pier was. And we went there and I threw the hook in the water with the pole. And I fished. I didn't catch a dog on thing, but I had a great time. And that was my memory. And so I have an affinity for the lighthouse. It's part of our city as your mayor. Whatever is affecting you in East Shore or in Westville or in Beaver Hills, it affects the whole. I want to bring our whole city together so that when you're having an issue in East Shore, which I'd be quite honest with you, you shouldn't be having it. You shouldn't be having this. This could have been, this could, could have been approached a whole lot better in my opinion, but it is what it is now. And what I've done is I filed for the, in, the environmental impact study. My position is, let's see where the study brings us to. Let's see what the advice is that comes from that study and see how we can find a way forward in addressing these issues and concerns that the residents have around the impact of the airport on the environment. Thank you, Shafiq. Andrew Farwell, how are you? Thank you for visiting with us. You have a question. I, I oh, think Susan Campion, Jay Wong Carter, and Carlotta Clark are in front of me. So I think I'm the fourth in line. Yeah, I think Naz actually has been waiting. And oh, okay, it was someone else. Well, thank you for yeah. that, I appreciate it. Yep. Let's, let's have it, while you're on, let's do it. Everybody will have a chance. <laughs> Asterisk? Well, as long as other people don't feel. Um, I promise you, I'll stay here all night. If anybody has questions, I'll stay here for as long as there are questions and as long as the candidates will stay. Okay. So let's uh, start. 
the, the mayor of East Haven is vehemently opposed to Tweed Airport being expanded and having the terminal move to East Haven. And it brings up a, a question about how we work with other towns. And I'm interested if the candidates would like to comment on this and tell us how they view regional planning and cooperation. Well, that's, that's a question for a whole other night. But yeah. that's a good question. So, but it puts it out there and no, maybe no. I'm sure there's other, going to be other discussions in the future. Let me suggest something to everybody who's still on here. And Naz, I'll be with you in just a second, I promise. Um, if there are more questions, if there are issues that we haven't addressed, if you would send them to me, I promise you, I will send them out to all of the candidates. And when I get answers from the candidates, I'd be more than happy to share them with you. Uh, if there are questions that you have tonight, let's let's do it. But uh, again, if there's something we left out or we didn't get to it or you think of it tomorrow, just send it to me and 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 we will communicate as a group, as the East Shore management team and, and all of the other communities um, and, and we'll get you an answer. Uh, Naz, your turn. Um, uh, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Howie and the management team for holding this space. Uh, my question is for Shafiq. Um, you have a very questionable professional record as a police officer, which included two murders of black men, as well as the attempted murder of another black man. And you have been disciplined for your poor judgment in those unfortunate incidents. Um, but those families and friends are still around in the city to um, be still for the hurt from that trauma. Um, you have also chose um, poor judgment and poor judgment in your civic profession, which is how you um, lost your ordinance seat and are here today looking for the mayor seat. So my question is, um, with your track record, um, why should the black community or any community that is um, in New Haven um, support you? Shafiq, would you address that please? Yes, and, and thank you, sir. So just to address, uh, I think three of the things you, mentioned something around a murder. Um, I was never involved in a murder. I've never accused of a murder um, and I've never played a part in any type of a murder. Um, that's one. Um, in terms of my police performance, I retired from the New Haven Police Department as a decorated sergeant um, with, with all of my retirement and all of my full rights as a decorated police officer, which I still possess that. Um, and the other question was, in terms of my automatic seat. Uh, as my automatic seat, you know, my life is very transparent. Uh, when I ran for mayor, I did not shut down my personal Facebook page. All my social media is still the same from the day that I established it. When I ran for Alder, um, I did a very good job in winning for Alder. My community supported me here in Beaver Hills. At the time I did have my multi-million dollar cleaning company and I discovered as I got close to the timeline of the bid, that there were actually a clause inside of that that specifically said no alder or officer could partake in this bid, whether you owned or purchased the material or were a partner in it, that I could not be a part of that bid and hold my seat. So I had a choice. I had 24 hours to determine that the 200 workers that I had on my payroll, many of them who were second chance, many of them who were immigrants, many of them who were poor, and 65% of them who were African American, and 80% of them who were from New Haven, I had to make a choice. Do I put my personal ambition of being an alder in front of them? Or do I leave them trying to figure out where they're going to get their next paycheck and their next meal? Because the process was going through a rocky uh, procedure with the Board of Ed. So I chose to fall on the sword. I chose to stand up for people like Charles Logan, who's been out of prison for four years, who lives in Fairhaven, um, trying to pay for his apartment. I fell on the sword and I resigned from the Board of Alders, what I cited to be as a conflict of interest. And I proceeded moving forward with my contract. I did not win the contract. Um, I cited some discrepancies around that. I took the proper action that I felt was entitled to me under my rights. And, you know, I decided midpoint 
that I would just move forward with running for my candidacy for the city of New Haven as mayor. So to be very specific to your question, why should the African-American community vote for me as a black candidate? This is what I would say, sir. I don't want anybody in the city of New Haven to vote for me because I'm a black candidate. I don't want anybody to vote for me because I'm a Muslim candidate. I don't want anybody to vote for me because I'm a police officer or a former police officer. I want people to vote for me because of all the things that I have done in this city through the course of my life to hold this city up, to fight for the rights of people, to provide jobs, to provide housing for people, and to be good leaders that bring people together. So that's my answer to your question. Thank you very much, Shifty. Uh, we had some other questions. Susan Campion is here. You have a question, Susan? I don't know if she's here. Let me go on and I'll come back to her. Carlotta Clark. Carlotta, you have a question? Yes, I have a question, Howie. Thank you so much. Why do you keep hitting them? So my question is, um, I understand that the App Foundation um, is working on putting mobile units throughout New Haven to dispense methadone. And while we do know there is a problem with uh, drug usage uh, throughout New Haven, I don't feel that the App Foundation has come out to the community and discussed any of that. Does any of the candidates know anything about this subject, about these mobile units coming out and dispensing methadones in the neighborhoods? So that's how we... Yeah, Justin? Sure, I appreciate this question, Ms. Ms. Carlotta, uh, and good to see you. So um, it, it's not just the App Foundation, but there was state legislation that was passed last legislative session. So in kind of winter of, not this past winter, but the winter before, that provided um, or allowed for what people are calling mobile methadone, which is basically bringing treatment more directly to people. And the overall goal with this is a good one in not having concentrated sites where everyone has to travel to, uh, like we've seen, for example, on Congress Avenue, where you have a lot of people from New Haven, from different neighborhoods in New Haven, and people from other towns. Uh, I, as, as I recall, it's approximately 1,000 people from New Haven and 700 from other towns that travel to Congress Avenue and the apt site there. The goal with mobile methadone is to not have that situation so you don't have drug dealers standing outside trying to take advantage of the most vulnerable, but to bring treatment to much smaller groups of people, the residents, so that they can get the treatment. There's not an, an, a kind of externalities impact on the neighborhood. And it also facilitates people actually having more access to treatment because some people won't travel that length. Um, the main thing here that I think is important is that apps, because they're providing 700 people from out of town treatment on their site, mobile methadone allows them to bring that treatment to other towns. And the, 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 the challenge has been that they have not been able to do that. And a lot of people are coming to New Haven for that treatment. And so the concept of mobile methadone is a good one. This legislative session, the state delegation is working to put some parameters around where they can and can't treat. And it's an important balance because we want them to be able to provide methadone in certain uh, locations for people while at the same time not wanting to have a, an impact on the surrounding community. And so the, the uh, legislators at the Capitol are working through what are those exact parameters. Uh, and you know, I think that the, the main thing here is making sure that we alleviate a lot of the challenges that we've seen around places like Congress Avenue. And mobile methadone is one of the tools that we can do use to do so. Thank you. Um, let me go. Oh, is there? Oh, Howie, Howie, can I respond to that real quickly? The question that Carlotta asked. Please, please, quickly, please. I, I'll be quick. So, no, I ha I haven't heard about that, and I think that's a problem. Um, people haven't heard about safe use sites until I started talking about them. The new methadone clinics is something that nobody heard about until way too late. And I have an FOI request to the city that is way overdue for emails to the App Foundation that just hasn't come back. So we talk about Joe Gannum and Bridgeport and, and a lack of transparency. I'm sorry, but we have that here in New Haven. 
Um, and so there is a lack of transparency. There's a lack of communication. There's a lack of community involvement on these issues. And it's just unacceptable. That's all. Uh, so it's, given that that was a criticism to me, Howie, I think that it's appropriate for me to be able to respond to that. Agreed. So Mr. Goldberg, Goldenberg, not having heard about mobile methadone, there was legislation at the Capitol that many people testified on last time that uh, was remarkably public. You, if you were paying attention, you couldn't have not heard about it. If you cared about this, you couldn't have not heard about it. Uh, so to, to accuse anyone of saying that mobile, the concept of mobile methadone is a secret is not, is not accurate. Um, safe use sites, uh, Mr. Gold, Mr. Goldenberg's raised that a number of times. Uh, there are cities around the nation that either are implementing or exploring the use of safe consumption sites, which basically um, uh, are supervised places where we ensure that people don't overdose, because if they do, they have immediate help from people. Th these types of uh, uh, policies and sites have been used effectively in Canada and other locations to dramatically reduce the number of individuals that have died of opioid overdoses. And we have been very clear as a community, Dr. Mayhul Dalau testified in support of the state uh, 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 hearing that would allow safe use consumption sites uh, approximately a month ago. We've been very open about that. Uh, so, you know, this comparing me to Mayor Ganim and the, the, you know, I'll look into the FOIA request. This is something that's, that is the first time hearing about it. We should respond to FOIA requests quickly. And, and I'm sorry for that. I will look into that. Um, but this, like, there's a secrets and, and all that stuff. It's just not helpful or appropriate. All right. Let's all take 30 seconds and just take a big, deep breath. And there are a couple of folks with questions left, and I want to be sure that we get to them. I understand the heat of the discussion, and I welcome the heat of the discussion. I just want to be sure that all voices are heard tonight. Uh, J1 Carter, you have a question? Howie. Yes. Susan Campion. Uh, Susan Campion. I called on someone else, Susan, and I'll get to you in a moment. Okay, thank you, Howie. You're welcome. Is J1 Carter here? Um, well, Good Susan evening. Campion. Thanks. Thanks, Chair Howie. Sorry, okay, Mr. Wanna, Carter, uh, go right uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Say good, e good evening to everybody. And um, Howie, thank you for this opportunity. Um, if you can encourage other chairs to get involved, probably somewhere in this fashion, it would be, would be, would be pretty cool because the messages have to be heard from each candidate across the board. Um, well, my, my, my question ask, is this for tonight. Ask the question, and before I forget, mm -hmm. I really want to thank all the candidates just for being here for speaking their minds and to allow the community to ask them the questions they did. And we'll thank them again at the end of this, but please go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, it's fine. Um, my concern or question is this. Um, the city is growing and we have a lot of challenges that we face. How can the city respond or how can the candidates present plans to protect our assets where we're not being as vulnerable um, with lawsuits, um, especially when it could be negligence, um, not um, properly following protocol and conduct. For instance, we, we are pending a current lawsuit with public safety officials um, over an arrest that went wrong. Um, that's going to be a huge settlement potentially. And then there's other things in the city that can, we're vulnerable at. How can we protect ourselves? Um, how can management protect us where our tax dollars are not going to be, um, or insurance money is not going to be um, at stake? Because right. we have so much things that we need to accomplish and very little resources. Um, a household can't run like that, but how can our city um, continue to run like that if we're trying to thrive? It's for every all the candidates possible. I appreciate the question. I, I don't I don't even know if I were a candidate how I could address that. Cities get sued. Judgments are entered or settlements are achieved, and they do the best they can. When when city employees create dangerous situations, uh, the city has to account for them. Uh, and hopefully the best practices are instituted and the city learns from its mistakes as well as its achievements. 
how to handle the next case. That's that's the way I would answer it as, as somebody who's really invested now in the future of the city. Um, you know, we 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 care. We all care. I, I think the thing that I've just absolutely fallen in love with in this city is the depth to which everybody really gives a damn about the city that they live in. And that's and that's just incredibly wonderful. We learn, and I, I used to be a lawyer, so I, I can answer your question in a way. We, we do what we do. We make mistakes when we make them. We own up when we make them, and we do the best we can to learn from those things. I, 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 that would be how I would answer the question. Any of the other candidates have anything that they want to say on that issue? Okay, Glenn Sheneman. Uh, Howie, I, I think that Excuse the me. question deserves a response. Uh, I think what Jay Wan is trying to say is that uh, we've seen the impact of some of these lawsuits. And, and correct, Jay Wan, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're referring to the Randy Cox incident. Um, but I, I think it is troubling. I, I was at a, um, a uh, press conference with the Civilian Review Board today, and it was very disconcerting to hear what's going on and how the members of the Civilian Review Board feel shut out of conversations. There's a lot of vacancies. They feel like it's been neglected. Um, so I, I think more accountability and, and community partnerships are needed to prevent these things from happening. And I, I think that's part of addressing, J1. I think what you raised. Yeah, if, you, if it's for clarity, um... That is an example of vulnerabilities, right? Where we're, it's a pending investigation, a pending case. You can see it's headline. It's on CNN, right? Neglect was the van failed inspection because there was no, um, what you would call, there was no um, seat belts in the back of the transport vehicle. There was a response, of course, to make changes afterwards. But let's just understand. There have been prior inspections saying that this vehicle needed attention. There's a lack of detail. I'm professional or not about, you know, attorneys professionally, detail matter in every job. And that liability falls on who? Us. We all care. But the question cannot be ignored that as we're hustling, bustling, we cannot let liabilities just overwhelm us in a way where this potential lawsuit is is not something we're just going to walk over and well, just learn not, you know, want, of course it's not and the city the city has its responsibilities and it has it has attorneys to deal with this it has parties who are responsible to uh, remedy these these problems to make sure that they don't happen again but you know my my, my father used to tell me stuff happens and it's terrible, and it's tragic, and there's no question about the tragedy of, of it, but we learn from our mistakes. I'm 80 and a half years old. I have never learned from anything that I did right. I've only learned from everything that I did wrong. That's how the city Howard, learns. That's how we evolve. Howard, man, how, how, how could I just respond to J1 there too? Uh, but it, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. I didn't know if you saw my hand or not. Uh, Jay Wan, thank, thanks for the question. You know, I saw you out uh, today with the press press conference asking for more help for the CPRB. Uh, I mean, the CRB here. Um, you know, I think your question on how we defend against you, prevent these things from occurring just in general is like really good training of staff and really good management of staff and preparing them for the situations that they're going to see. I think we want all our leaders in every every department of the city to really help their own employees and their team members to think through the situations that they're going to face and, and prepare for them appropriately. So what you're talking about is, you know, you use the example of Randy Cox. We have uh, the police department go out to potentially arrest the man with a, a truck that has no seatbelts in the back where somebody is just very liable to get like rocked around as it's driving. Like that should not happen. And good training um, and good preparedness could prevent that. The other thing we need in general is just good oversight as well. And so your role on the CRB is super important. The CRB was a great uh, innovation that we had here in New Haven, and we've let it wither on the vine. I know you've been frustrated. I know many, many other commissioners have been frustrated. I've spoken to them personally. 
Um, it's set up in a model that's not set up for success. And what we need to do is think about our government systems and how we set them up for success. Right now, we expect commissioners from the CRB to go down to the police department and like do the investigations themselves, to go over the documentation themselves. Just sitting on the board itself is enough of a commitment for a volunteer. It's so difficult as it is. And then expecting to do this extra work, they're not like equipped to do that. That is not your specialty. What you can do is analyze and render judgment as a civilian overseeing the police, but you can't engage in this sort of investigation yourself. And that's partially why we see the system falling apart. So I think we really need to think through when you want to prevent things or oversee them when they, when they occur wrong, think through the systems that are being used to do this and make them more efficient make them better and make them effective. And when they're not effective, we need to make changes. And I see, think the CRB is one of the prime examples of where we need to make significant changes. Howie, if I could respond as well. Um, so there, there was a, a one inaccurate statement about there being an inspection of the vehicle uh, prior to this incident. That's not true. Uh, the, the vehicle was not required to have seatbelts, even though it should have been our policy to have seatbelts in, in the vehicles in my view. What happened to Randy Cox was tragic and it should never happen again. Uh, and I think uh, the spirit of a lot of the things that were said is, is very accurate and true that we wanna make sure that we reduce liability, but more importantly, we keep people safe that are in police custody. Uh, I think that's the, the core of this issue right here. And we have done a, a significant amount of changes in policy, but also training that is nationally recognized uh, in de-escalation and uh, in duty to intervene. All of our entire police force has received this training uh, so that we can reduce the likelihood of this never happening again. The other part of this is on the accountability side. Uh, one of the ways that we can ensure that this never happens again is to hire the right people. And if someone makes a wrong decision to ensure that they are accountable. And we've worked very, very hard to do that. Uh, the, the chief has been clear about accountability for these uh, officers that have been involved. Uh, we had a, uh, a press conference about that several weeks ago where the chief uh, shared that information. Uh, we immediately passed this uh, the investigation onto the state and the officers have been brought up on criminal charges as well. Uh, CRB, uh, Mr. Brennan mentioned something about the, the CRB withering on the vine, uh, I think were the words that were chosen. So in addition to our internal affairs uh, uh, process and the police commission process, the city has created a civilian review board that I supported. Uh, it was created prior to my administration, agreed that because of the appointment process that goes through the community management teams, it has been challenging to appoint some people to the commission. Uh, there's been a number of people that have resigned on it as well. We want to make sure that it is successful. We want to make sure that it is successful. And I think that there should potentially be some changes in the ordinance to make sure that we facilitate people more quickly being appointed to the body. Uh, we are also working on identifying a room. The police department is working, has been working on this for some time where people from the CRB can review cases outside of the police station and within city hall. So there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done here. We're working on those issues. But most importantly, we need to make sure that something that happened, what happened to Randy Cox never happens again. And agreed, Susan Campion has had her hand up for a really long time. First of all, I came late. I want to say thank you to all the candidates. You've done a great job. It's tough. The questions have been straightforward and heartfelt. I have the privilege of saying that I have been a lifetime resident of the city of New Haven. And this question is to Shafri. I truly believe with all my intuitive and knowledge that the city has never been more ready to come together and to engage in these tremendously challenging times, gun violence, the problems with our schools, poverty, housing. My profession is addiction. It's a passion 
and it is shown me the miracles that can happen. So my question to you, Shafriq, is with the tremendous challenges, okay. how would you well, have to bring wait. people together and, oh, excuse, oh, I, I, that woman spoke, and knit the difference and the tremendous diversity so that we can come together unified and strong and ready to be creative and to engage in conflict resolution, all the things that make a 2023 great city even stronger. So this is for Shafriq. Thank you, Ms. Campion. You know, it starts with the people as a mayor who I surround myself with. Right. As a mayor, I surround myself with people from the community that's from the communities, the various communities that become an ambassador onto those communities yeah. and are able to deliver resources. Right. I, I, I always, often travel and I hear people say, you know, we want to be heard. It's one thing they said is two ways to listen to a person. You can listen for the intent of responding or you can listen to actually hear what they are saying to you. When I decided to run for mayor and I started looking at all the neighborhoods, what I heard in East Shore was environmental, environmental impact from the airport. I didn't jump up and say, we need to shut the airport down. Environmental impact study. When I went into Newhallville, they're talking about the methadone clinic, but you know what they're also talking about? They would like to have coffee shops on Dixwell Avenue where they could actually sit out and drink coffee like they do on Orange Street and have donut shops and have housing. So it's really about, as the mayor, I'm not Batman. I can't be everywhere and I know I won't be able to be everywhere. But what I can do, those 112 jobs that are open right now at the city, those 112 unfilled New Haven, city of New Haven jobs, I can come back into your communities and say, we have these openings downtown for jobs come down and apply for these jobs. Let's get our communities working in City Hall. I don't believe in hiring relatives. I don't believe in hiring friends. I believe in hiring the right people to do the job and get it done. So that's where I believe it's going to start because, listen, I've got to be able to answer the tough questions. I've got, as we say, I have to have the thick skin because whatever you ask me, I have to translate it into that's something that's important to you. And I will say this, one of my favorite uncles, who I called him my big brother, he was eight years apart from me. He struggled with heroin from the age of 18. He was homosexual. He was in the closet at the time. We came from a, a Baptist family and he couldn't talk about his sexuality. He's no longer with me, but I understand the battle of addiction. And it's not always about mental health. Sometimes it's about what's going on around you and the lifestyle that you feel that that's your life and that's the life you have to live and others don't see you. I wanna be the mayor that sees people. I wanna hear you, I wanna see you, and I wanna embrace these communities to move us forward together we can do that. Thank you. Hi, this is Glenn. I uh, had one more question. I'd like to open this up to everybody. It's definitely more of a Ward 17, more Ward 18 type question. I do really appreciate the vast array of questions that encompass the entire city that we've had here tonight. Um, in words 17 and 18, the sidewalks and streets are terrible. I mean, terrible, like dangerous. My next door neighbor face planted herself walking down the street with her dog, bruised up her face really bad on the sidewalks. It was disturbing to actually look at her. My street, every time the tide is high, it floods over. And I've heard all kinds of talk about this and all kinds of concerns, but um, it's really bad out there, and I don't see that anything has been done 
to address the needs of the actual homeowners and middle class taxpayers in this city. And I'd like to see it, and I know I'm localizing this to wards 17 and 18, but I've walked my dog at Edgewood Park. It's bad there too. I mean, what are we going to do to fix the streets and sidewalks for our middle class tax paying residents? That's it to everybody. So, Howie, you're on mute. So I could, who would like to speak first? I mean, this is out to the candidates. I mean, I can start. Okay. You, sure. I can start. So uh, you're talking about Concord? I'm talking about Concord right now. Yeah. Right. I'm so the, the, now. the engineer uh, has been out there multiple times and they're fixing the pipe this week. Um, and I understand this problem has been going on for a long time, but the engineer is fixing the pipe this week. Uh, there's, a, a, as many people here know, uh, a lot of infrastructure improvements that are going on uh, on the East Shore. There's renovations to Lighthouse Point. A new playground in Lighthouse Point will be replaced. Uh, it is um, six months out approximately. Uh, it's going to be a very nice new playground. They um, have built the new maintenance building at the entrance to uh, Lighthouse Point Park and are about to start renovations on the bathhouse. Uh, Nathan Hale School had the first in the state speed table on a state road. Uh, the tragic incident with Zane Thomas, a 15-year-old child that was uh, killed because of dangerous driving along Townsend Avenue. We've had conversations with the state about putting in more speed tables along the cove there on Townsend Avenue. Uh, in addition, there in the pipeline, there are multiple speed humps that are, and you probably are, the signs may already be up for multiple sites uh, around the airport as well. Uh, uh, the East Shore Park, uh, thanks to the uh, support of Martin Looney and Al Paolillo, has about a half a million dollars going towards renovations in the baseball field. Uh, Salperto, the building that used to be adjacent to what's kind of like an ice, ice rink, we are doing renovations there to activate that site as well. Um, and so there's a lot of infrastructure improvements around traffic calming and, uh, and other things around uh, the, the neighborhood that we're working on. And you know what, this is a, one of the most common requests we get all around the city around traffic calming and sidewalk fixing and paving. We work very hard to ensure that there's uh, equitable support around the city and we'll continue to do so. Okay. Anybody else like to comment? I just have one question. Um, uh, well, oh, I'm happy to comment on that. I, I just had seen Shafiq's hand up, so I was trying to let him go. Oh, uh, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Liam. Yes, um, when I ran for Alder in Beaver Hills, sidewalks, tree stumps, um, tree trimming, and, and potholes is what got me in office um, with the support of my community. I was actually very shocked at the fact that it wasn't the gun violence, even though we dealt with that even in Beaver Hills. It wasn't the car crashes. It wasn't the pedestrians struck and killed at Wheeling the Boulevard. It wasn't the, but the bicyclist struck. It was potholes, sidewalks, tree, tree removal, stumps, and trees being cut. Um, you know, as the mayor going in, as your new mayor, we need a new parks director. We need a parks department separated from public works. We don't need to have the parks department um, merge with public works. This is part of the problem that's happening. Public works does a very specific trade. It's a very specific trade. And parks department does something different. Um, the current structure right now, their public works director is not even over the paving in the sidewalks. And how do I know? Because I met with the union presidents. I met with the union presidents to ask them, how could I better improve this structure for the city? This is what the people are asking for. My colleagues, former colleagues on the board of Alders, they're hamstringed and tied, trying to get sidewalks for their neighborhood. There's a system in the city where sidewalks are graded according to colors. If your sidewalk is really, really bad, it gets a color, it's rated by the engineering department. If it can be shaved, 
you might some of you may have seen the machine comes out and they shave the the, the, the sidewalk down but if you're elderly it's like a it's like a ski jump right and so that's not safe and so when we think about the money and the infrastructure i understand that some of that money uh, comes from capital projects which was the 50 50 sidewalk program i know that not last year but the year before that the money was moved from that sidewalk program, the 50-50 sidewalk program, which was basically the city paid 50% and you paid 50% to have that sidewalk replaced in front of your house. Um, we can understand that when we talk about a city and sidewalks, it's right inside of it in the city. It's a beautiful, most beautiful caption. It talks about how sidewalks is the vehicle for communities to build and for communities to thrive and grow. So these are very important uh, walkways and transportation thoroughs for, for the people in the community that walk on a day-to-day -day basis. So we just need better leadership and management around that in a more intentful purpose on prioritizing the replacement of those sidewalks. Thank you. Liam, did you want to comment? Yeah, sure thing, Glenn. Th thanks for the question. You know, I, I don't think it's too localized. First, it's always fair to ask this of your government, you know? I mean, this is your town and you get the right to ask that. And like, these are fair questions. But second, this is the type of question that folks are asking all over. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I was shocked at, I've been out in New Hallville a lot the last few days. Um, and like the traffic calming thing is just so big with the residents and it's just coming up so often. Um, it's something that really affects people's quality of life. And you want to have a good quality of life in your city. And I think everyone in the city deserves a good quality of life. So I think addressing the issue uh, comes down to kind of like two things when you think about it. Part of it is like good management and having good management. And part of it is vision and government innovation and how to achieve that. So when I'm talking about management, what I'm talking about is, for example, like the milling of roads. This is an issue that's come up a bunch around the city. So people want to know when the roads are going to be milled and they want uh, DPW to tell them when the roads are going to be milled. Some folks, like there were folks in Upper Westville who wanted to know when the roads were going to be milled because they wanted to put in curves, but they couldn't tell. And in fact, actually our own Department of Engineering couldn't get a, a schedule on when DPW was going to mill their roads and they weren't even talking to each other. So that's a problem. Secondly, like for another example, like the Safe Streets Coalition folks, they want to know when the roads are going to be milled. They want to get a schedule about that because they want to canvas the neighborhood. They want to ask them, what do you want? Would you like, you know, a bike lane? Would you like more, uh, more um, trees? Would you like a crosswalk here? They want to know what those needs are, and then they want to advocate for them. So when the road is milled, those interventions, those new changes can become. But no one can get this schedule out of the city. That's really important. I mean, that's a failure because we need to be able to get access to that information to make the changes that we want to see in our neighborhoods. And, and the public has a right to get that. And if it's managed well, that's stuff that should be able to get out to the public. The second thing I'm talking about is vision and, gover vision and government innovation. Um, you know, we had a talk about money before, and I think there's a lot of things that kind of can be done without money, like zoning can help us create more affordable housing. Um, but also, uh, some things take money. So like paving your, your road and paving your sidewalk takes some money. That all falls on the New Haven taxpayers. And But your roads are torn up by everyone who rolls through there, whether they live in New Haven or not. Those people come through and they use your roads. So I think it's also really important that we need to get do everything we can to get buy-in and financial support from the people who use our resources and put off those costs to our own residents so that our residents can get some benefit out of that. And so like one specific thing, I think there are like sort of regulatory fees you can put in place for some certain uses of our roads, like ride sharing. So people who are taking rides, whether they live in the suburbs, but they're coming in and out of New Haven, or they're students who are doing it here in New Haven. Other cities have had lots of success having a regulatory fee in place to get just a little, a little fee on top of that. It's different than property taxes. That can go right into um, Department of Public Works to help pay for your sidewalks and, and, and your pavement. And I think that's something we need to do because we need to, people are going to come and use it. We want them here. It's good for business. It's good for the growth of the city. But they also need to help support it. We are, we are constrained by our property tax base and we got to be more creative about how we get uh, payment for that. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Camille, did you have a question? I just want to talk um, quickly. Hi, um, candidates. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Um, 
I think that this is the first time in a very long time that I think that there's a lot of hope um, just in the conversation of being able to just really get to talk to you guys and get to know the candidates a little bit better. But when we talk about innovation for 10 years, I have been asking, please come up with a visual task board, whether you link up with C-Clicks Fix or you come up with some kind of visibility so that we as individuals, I own a home, a home here. I know where, if I put in a request for, to get a tree, trimmed. I know where it is in the process. I, I get a number back that gives me the opportunity. Even if it's three years out, I know that all of my neighbors are ahead of me, but I know that I'm in a, a feedback system that gives me an understanding as to where I am in the process. I could call about a tree that has fallen down and it could potentially be picked up quickly by the parks department. So yay to them and they're rock stars, but that tree that's still uh, a viable um, viability liability to the city is now potentially still there unmarked and I don't know where it is in the process. And of course, this is, you know, this is an example, but we need a visual task board. It is 2023. I think that the current mayor can do something. I hope that the candidates, if you guys, one of you become the mayor, you create this kind of platform. And I think that that would help with a lot of the anxiety of our members who don't know where their questions are and where they lie. The Board of Ed, I hope that they create that first because there's parents that talk about issues that, that we don't know where those issues lie. There's been issues that are open for 10 years. No one's ever addressed them. We need to be able to action them. The, the Parks Department and just general issues to the city. If you could do that, I would be a happy resident. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two more, two more. I have Dennis. Yeah, thank you and uh, thank you for the candidates and the mayor for uh, for attending this evening and thank you for hosting. I have a question concerning uh, city finance governance. So, um, you know, the city has received, you know, roughly $200 million, I think, in federal funding. Uh, extra money from the city, from the state, and then an additional $10 million from uh, from Yale. We don't have, the city has not had a uh, full-time controller for three years now. Um, and the person who's an acting controller is not a resident of the city that's in violation of the charter. The tax assessor is also not a resident of the city. I believe that's a violation of the charter. The city audit is six months past due, and the Financial Review and Audit Commission has had not met for nine months until I submitted a opinion piece to the New Haven Independent. What will the candidates do? Um, do they have any plan in place to provide some sort of financial oversight to the Board of Alders and the Mayor's Office? All right, two minutes for everybody. Liam, you have an answer for that? Two minutes yeah, I mean, the, on the clock. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks, Howie. Um, you know, I think I think the financial situation is, is a big issue. Um, I think the fact that we have not had a permanent tax assessor here in uh, New Haven for the whole of this administration is a serious problem. I think what we're seeing, you know, you saw a New Haven Independent article just last year assessing, looking at all the under assessments that have occurred with all the big properties downtown. Um, and the loss of revenue that the city is suffering because of that. This is huge. I mean, estimates that we've been seeing uh, with my team is like, we're upwards towards $20 million a year um, being lost toward, to the city of New Haven with underassessed properties. That is money that can go to your schools, that can go to your pavement, that can go to your sidewalks, that can be used to reduce your taxes. Um, and we need um, actually like real focus from the assessor's office and a permanent person in place there who has the ability and the willingness to do this. And um, minutes, I William. think, okay, thank okay. you. Shafiq, two minutes. Yes, thank you. You know, government, the way it's laid out, it's, it's laid out a certain way to work a certain way. We are down 112 jobs in the city of New Haven. Um, of those 112 jobs, one is the comp controller. Uh, we do have a charter and that charter needs to be followed because as a city leader, we have to follow the charter if we expect other people that in other divisions and departments to follow the policies and procedures as well. And so as the mayor, I absolutely positively um, would 
would fill that comp controller's position. I would offer those two individuals now who are in those temporary positions, because they're temporary positions, um, the opportunity to move into the city and comply by the charter. And if not, we would have to go and search for those positions to have those positions filled by people that would be willing to comply with the conditions of the charter. In addition, there is a charter suggestion out there right now to take top level city jobs in this trial revision and let those jobs go to people and allow them to live outside the city. I can tell you that as a New Haven mayor, I'm absolutely against taking jobs outside of this city. That's also part of growing our tax base. And so these are the ways that we run a, 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 an efficient city. In fact, up oh, it's up. That's the buzzer. It's the buzzer. Bam. Wendy Hamilton, you still here? All right, look at that. I just gained two minutes. Tom Goldenberg, two minutes. Sure. Um, just to piggyback on what some of the other candidates said, and and Dennis, uh, I think you said it really well. I mean, we we saw an influx of federal funds of more than 100, I think it was 115 million or more. We saw, uh, you know, the, the money from pilot, which is is not guaranteed in the future. It's It's subject to renewal. Uh, and yet taxes went up in some neighborhoods by 40%. It's, it's kind of bewildering. We also saw the addition of, um, I'm just looking to see, I think it was a total of 60 new positions in the city over two years. Uh, I, I may need to correct that, but it was uh, 30 new positions in this year. And I think, I think that's correct, about 60 over two years. And what do we have to show for it? I mean, the, the gun violence prevention quarter leaves after three months. And I, I don't know, Liam, if this was a quote that you found somewhere that he it was because of a lack of investment. I think there is, a again, we come back to a crisis of leadership, a, an inability to inspire, an inability to attract a following that is that stays with him. I mean, you're, Justin, your communications director joined Shafiq's team as a campaign manager. That is pretty much unheard of. Um, I it's two minutes. So I, I, I think this all goes to the, the fact of an inability to attract talent and keep talent, and we need new leadership. Mr. Mayor, answer this question. I'm going to ask you a question a different way. I think we all, especially the candidates, need to decide, are we for New Haven or against New Haven? People on the outside of New Haven criticize the city and have for years, insinuate that the city has some kind of financial mismanagement, insinuate that our schools have enough money when that is not accurate. And for our own people, you all, to continue to perpetuate a narrative where we're dysfunctional when we are not, is not in the best interest of our city. We shouldn't be shooting at each other here, which is what's going on right now. Michael Gormley is the budget director and acting controller and has done an excellent job. We have had upgradings from our rating agencies. We have stabilized our finances. Point to me where the corruption is. Point to me. You, you say things on the outside that, that damage the reputation of our cities that are inaccurate when you don't solve the problem. And I, and I want to finish with, I think, an important thing. There's a re you, th you don't think I'd want to fill the controller position? Of course I'd want to fill the controller position. We need someone that's going to be able to do that job well. I think, and I've been public about this, I think we need to eliminate the residency requirement. We've increased the amount of pay for that position so we can attract better people. We need to be practical about these problems, address them practically, not just criticize each other and criticize the city of New Haven. We're a very functional city with a lot of people that are working really hard to improve the lives of so many residents. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everybody. I want you to get home safely. That's always my wish for everyone at the end of all of our meetings, especially the Zoom meetings. This was really just, wonderful. Let's just let Gary be the last question. Did you see that? Gary Googs, you have a question? I do, actually. Um, and just like to echo um, others on like requests and stuff for like sidewalks and stuff. Now, I know Concord Street was brought up with the with the water issue. What about our issue on Townsend Ave that it's just the street has been caving in for three months and that's just been an ongoing issue and the city's fix to it is just let's keep putting cold patch into that hole. What it, uh, They finally marked it out to call before you dig after three months now. They marked it out this week. 
And then another issue with uh, with water and drainage issues is uh, on the lower end of Dean Street towards Burr Street. Ever since they repaved Dean Street five years ago, every time it rains, the water puddles up on Dean Street and you literally have to go on the opposite side of the road to um, to get around the puddles without, you know, there's been times where I'm coming down Dean Street and I've almost gotten it head on. So the Townsend Avenue, in addition to the pipe, the pipe is being fixed. It's estimated to be fixed this Friday. Things always take a little bit longer than expected. As you mentioned, it's marked out. Um, but but uh, the Sydney engineer assures me that it's going to be fixed. Justin, I have one question for you, if I may. Is the bathhouse going to be open by the summertime? I don't think so, but I will double check. Would you do that? Because my... You know, the, the community is obviously and the city is very interested in that. If you could give me some information, I'll pass yeah, it. Yeah, I understood the parks, the parks uh, um, and uh, youth program also relies on that too. So I'll, I'll look into it and get back to you, Howie. I appreciate it. I want to thank everybody for, for just for doing this. I want to thank the candidates and wish them all good luck, wish them all good health. To all of my members of the East Shore Management Team, thank you so much for your support. Get home safely. If you have any questions at all, anything we didn't cover, just send them to me and I'll get you some answers from whatever the sources are. So thank you so much for everything. Just be well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. You bet. Thank you.